Well, aloha everyone and welcome back to Unit 14 of Biology 101 here at Chaminade University. When we left off last time we were talking about primordial soup and whether or not something that we know can happen, asking whether or not it actually did happen. And uh, again, we demonstrated that we can do it in the laboratory setting, and we also know that if we have enough time and a sufficiently large pool of molecules, even something that might happen at a very, very rare opportunity can still occur multiple times. And given that we had ample time and space for these events to happen in order to lead to the development of life, it's very, very possible that this is how it happened. We know that Earth was created or formed about 4.5 billion years ago and was extremely hot at that time was created by meteorites continuously smashing into a forming planet and the kinetic energy of all these rocks that were coming from the um, extraterrestrial environment was converted immediately into heat upon impact and that meant that it took another 0.2 billion years for it to cool down enough for water to actually condense into liquid form another billion years later approximately we have fossil evidence um, so that's found in rocks, and we're able to do carbon dating on those rocks to demonstrate how old they are. We've demonstrated that some of these fossils are as old as 3.4 billion years old. Uh, we know that life actually arose prior to this, approximately 3.9 billion years ago, in an era that we call the Precambrian era. And we have specialty types of scientists, including geologists and paleontologists who study rocks and fossils. They've uh, discovered a specialty way of naming eras, periods, and epochs, and this is a way to delineate large span times, a geological time, much larger than any of us could consider on our own relative lifetimes. Here's an artist rendering of early Earth, again extremely hot, no ozone, uh, lots of meteorites coming through. Now this is a depiction of how we separate out life on Earth into different periods, and I'm not going to ask you any of these, I just kind of, again, I'm going to tell you kind of talk story style. So we have a uh, the evolution of the genus Homo, which is us, it didn't happen until the most recent time frame, so the Pleistocene era, right? So in the time frame of geological history, we actually came in at like the 11th hour and 59 minute mark, if you know what I mean. We're at the very, very last moment on the evolutionary time scale. So we're working our way backwards here. We categorize things in eras, and then in periods of those eras, we all are recognized the Jurassic era, right? That's when we have dominance of large dinosaurs, etc. We also have the arrival of the first birds and some conifers. And then the Paleozoic is an era that was uh, even older than that. And these are the major things that occurred during uh, different periods of the Paleozoic era. Again, I'm not going to quiz you on all of the different things, but we are going to talk about most of these major events in the upcoming slides. So this is where we were just talking about the Pre-Cambrian era. This is the very beginning of when life first started developing. First developing the animals like soft-bodied marine invertebrates that were going to be found in shallow seas in the oceans. Eventually, we're going to get to multicellular organisms, which turn into eukaryotes, um, again, millions of years ago. And I'm never going to ask you time frames. I just kind of want to give you the relative order of what's happening here. So how did that happen? The very first organisms to arise on Earth. Remember, we were talking about them being single-celled. That means they were prokaryotes. Cells that lack a membrane-bound nucleus, they're very basic, basic forms of life. Generally, they were going to be something that we would consider bacteria, right? Primitive forms of bacteria. And they probably, just like bacteria today, obtained nutrients and all their energy from the absorption of all the organic molecules in their surrounding environments. And as I mentioned previously, Earth was lacking in oxygen gas, so they more likely than not were metabolizing their molecules anaerobically. That means without using oxygen. Now, um... The very next stage would be to be able to harness the energy of the sun to be able to synthesize glucose or sugar type molecules and this would be the evolution of photosynthesis and this was a huge leap in evolution of organisms on earth. Photosynthesis is also going to change the atmosphere of all the, the rest of the planet as well. Photosynthesis requires hydrogen and so the first pho photosynthetic bacteria most likely use hydrogen sulfide gas which would have been dissolved in the water in the shallow seas that we were talking about. And there wasn't a ton of hydrogen sulfide available, so the shortage of this hydrogen sulfide is what's going to set the ball in motion for the evolution of the specialty photosynthetic bacteria. Again, they're using the sunlight to be able to harness that energy and turn it into sugars. Um, and therefore, be, in being able to replace hydrogen sulfide with water, most abundant source of, of hydrogen means that now they have an almost unlimited ability to photosynthesize. Now using water as the basis of your photosynthesis uses water and carbon dioxide as the, um, as the reactants. 
and it converts them into sugar and releasing oxygen. So over time, we're now emitting significant amount of free oxygen into the atmosphere for the first time. And now that oxygen's available, oxygen's combining with iron in the Earth's crust, and there's actually a rust layer in the Earth's crust that the uh, people who study the rock can tell you this is exactly when this era of life occurred. Because at this point, while we're releasing a ton of oxygen, now that oxygen is able for the first time to interact with the iron, and so we end up with a rust layer in the rock. Um, so newly liberated oxygen is quickly consumed, right? Remember, as I said, oxygen is very reactive. And again, iron is a reactive element, and so we have a very high level of iron in rocks that were formed during that time frame. So it's a way that geolo geologists can mark specific time frames in our um, Earth's history. But eventually, over time, we get more and more oxygen, so it starts accumulating in our atmosphere. And we know this by the analysis of rocks. We can break them open and do chemical analysis of little bubbles trapped inside. And that can allow us to detect the levels of atmospheric oxygen. And we know that the significant amounts of atmospheric oxygen, something that would be comparable to life on Earth today, or the atmospheric conditions today, uh, appeared approximately 2.3 billion years ago. Um, and more than likely, it's going to be bacteria that were photosynthetic, like the cyanobacteria. And they were the first ones to produce that oxygen that was going to be off-gassed into the environment. And they did so by breaking down water, right? Water, H2O, they're using the hydrogen, they're off-gassing the oxygen. And the oxygen that was produced then is very likely some of the same oxygen molecules today. So some of the oxygen molecules that you're breathing in at this very moment are very likely to have been recycled oxygen molecules expelled over 2 billion years prior. Um, as I mentioned, oxygen is very um, reactive, and because it's so reactive, it's potentially dangerous because it's able to break things down or oxidize. And so in the very early stages of this conversion of our atmosphere from low oxygen to high oxygen conditions, um, it probably exterminated many anaerobic organisms, organisms that got their energy without using oxygen in their pathways. Um, additionally, just like the way the iPhone 2 outcompeted the iPhone 1, etc., um, organisms that were able to use oxygen in their aerobic pathways to be able to um, convert glucose, for example, into energy, what are they doing? They are now harnessing so much more energy per glucose molecule. For example, an anaerobic pathway, and if you were to look at photosynthesis, which we skipped that chapter, um, you would recognize that an anaerobic pathway releases approximately four um, ATP molecules per sugar molecule. Whereas the total pathway anaerobic anaerobic conditions that normally happen in cellular respiration releases 34 to 36 almost tenfold more energy from the same molecule of glucose. So that's a rapid competition that would very quickly outcompete the anaerobic um, bacteria. So that's increase in oxygen means that any organism that's able to have an aerobic metabolism that is breaking down sugar using oxygen is going to outcompete its neighbors very, very quickly. And so that provides heavy selective pressure in the environment for the evolution of the um, aerobic bacteria. All right, so once microbes are able to use oxygen in metabolism, they're also um, able to use it as a chemical defense against the action of oxygen because now the oxygen that comes into their system is not damaging them or becoming reactive. It has a purpose, and they're using it. They're harnessing that energy, um, and so it's causing much less damage to those organisms as well. So it's kind of a double-edged sword in comparison to those anaerobic organisms. Aerobic organisms blew the competition out of the water. Right, so now you're able to channel that destructive power of oxygen through aerobic respiration, generating useful energy for the cell. That's pretty much what I just said. Um, all right, so eventually prokaryotes began to proliferate, proliferate more and more and more of them, and eventually they started to um, engulf the smaller ones. So the early predators didn't have photosynthesis, right, um, and aerobic metabolism, or aer aerobic metabolism, and so they were very, very inefficient at um, processing their prey, so they couldn't turn their prey into material that they were able to use in a very efficient manner. So the next level of evolution was compartmentalization of functions. So as cells started to compartmentalize different regions of their cell for particular purposes, using their internal membrane structure, the endomembrane system, that greatly improved the efficiency of the early cells and their ability to digest the food that they have consumed and be able to recycle it into components that they're able to use later. Um, and so these eukaryotes, as they were called, are going to appear approximately 1.7 billion years ago. Again, cells that are in compartmentalizing into organelles specific for specific functions. So where does that leave mitochondria and chloroplasts? As you may remember, chloroplasts and mitochondria were both originally prokaryotic organisms. 
but they have specialty functions. So chloroplasts, as we mentioned previously, are able to harness the energy of the sun and undergo photosynthesis, and using that energy, they create sugars that then the plant can use later on. Um, and mitochondria are very efficient at breaking down those sugars. They perform a process called cellular respiration, which is the equal and opposite of uh, photosynthesis. Essentially what happens is you take the glucose molecule and you break it down, releasing energy, and you break it down into um, its basic sugar, um, sorry, from sugar into water and oxygen. And so what happened is that a larger prokaryote engulfed these smaller prokaryotes in the process of becoming a eukaryote. It's kind of in this weird system of gray area where we're evolving. Um, and so if the early eukaryotic cells acquired mitochondria or chloroplasts, or, I mean, they're precursors, right? They're great, great, great ancestors. Then they were able to contain those organisms, and instead of consuming them, they recognized that mitochondria provide energy and chloroplasts are able to harness energy from the sun. And what that means is that plant cells, or these early eukaryotic cells that were going to become plants, took those chloroplasts and used them to harness the energy from the sun and use them to their advantage. So instead of digesting the chloroplasts, they put them to work. And it's called an endosymbiont hypothesis because it means that both parties get a good deal out of this. So the um, mitochondria and the chloroplasts get the protection of the host cell, while the host cell gets either the ability to create energy by harnessing the energy from the sun and storing it in uh, glucose molecules, or break those glucose down molecules down to release that energy in the mitochondria. So this is a symbiotic relationship where both organisms benefit from this relationship. And we know that mitochondria and chloroplasts are different from their host cells because they both have internal um, folding of their membranes that are very different from that of the eukaryotic cell. Um, but I digress. So how do the eukaryotes end up making their internal organelles, and very likely this happened, again, evolutionary pressure, so the ones that ended up having this accidentally had an advantage over the ones that did not, and that led to a rise of this internal membrane structure, where we have an inward folding of the membrane of the single cell predator that eventually becomes um, multiple different regions, where we can end up getting, um, we can end up with organelles. So, Aerobic respiration uses oxygen, and that's going to be used to metabolize the food that comes into the body and it's in order to gain energy for the cell. And the aerobic then releases some of that energy in the form of ATP or similar molecules back into its cytoplasm, which the mitochondria are now able to use. So the anaerobic predatory cell within its symbiotic bacteria, so the anaerobic predatory cell at this point would have been the precursor to the... Um, um, the eukaryotes and the symbiotic bacteria inside would be the, the precursor to, for example, the mitochondria or the chloroplast. And now they have a great advantage over other anaerobic cells because they have the ability to metabolize their food aerobically. So while the mitochondria and the chloroplast get protection, the, um, the larger cell is able to get the extra energy out of every glucose molecule. Again, almost tenfold extra energy out of a single glucose molecule. That gives a great selective advantage meaning that the predatory cell is going to leave a higher number of offspring than its surrounding competitors. Therefore, over time, we're going to end up with a lineage of cells that have mitochondria and chloroplasts inside them. And over time, the bacterium are going to lose the ability to live independently of the host. And that means that the descendants of that bacteria are going to evolve into what we now know today to be mitochondria, which have their own DNA and their own membrane structure, but hide very efficiently and effectively within um, eukaryotic cells and just perform the process of cellular respiration whereby they break down um, sugar and release energy in the form of ATP for the cell. All right, so this allows like a predatory prey relationship that actually ended up becoming a symbiotic relationship. All right, um, and they also, here's this is an example of how that happens. So here's an anaerobic predatory prokaryotic cell, which is a precursor to our eukaryotic cells. They're going to engulf that aerobic bacteria. So this is a precursor to the mitochondria. It's able to break down sugars all the way to get 30, um, 34 or 36 ATP instead of the four that you could get from the anaerobic pathway. Same thing with the photosynthetic bacterium. It gets engulfed inside this um, precursor cell, and eventually we end up with a cell that has photosynthetic capabilities and mitochondrial capabilities. And this is what we believe to be the probable origin of mitochondria and chlor chloroplasts in our eukaryotic cells. And we have tons of lines of evidence that support that, specifically the fact that there's specific features of um, eukaryotic organelles and living bacteria that are very, very similar biochemically. 
Um, and we also have intermediates that we can look to as um, a demonstration as kind of that gray area where we have organisms that are still alive today that are similar to what we believe to be the ancestors that hypothetically, including the amoeba um, called Palomoxia palustris. I apologize if I butchered that. Um, but anyway, it lacks the mit mitochondria, but it hosts a permanent population of aerobic bacteria that carry a very similar role to the mitochondria. And there are similar things that happen with coral, etc., that harbor photos photosynthetic bacteria that would be very similar to what we believe to be the precursors toward the chloroplasts. Um, all right, so here's symbiosis within a modern cell. Here's a bunch of chloroplasts inside or precursor molecules to the chloroplasts. These are going to be on their own bacteria, but they're photosynthetic bacteria that live underneath the surface of this paramecium here, which allow it to be able to perform photosynthetic capability, even though itself doesn't have that capability. Um, all right, so let's move forward. So the next thing that happens is we have algae occurring. So we're starting to get um, the, the unicellular organisms are turning into multicellular organisms. Um, and that happened first in algae, and that would have occurred approximately 1.2 billion years ago. And these are single-celled eukaryotic organisms that contain chloroplasts, or at least the precursors to the chloroplasts. And because the algae were large and multicellular, it would have been more difficult for predators, because remember at this point all predators are single-celled, to engulf. And so therefore it would allow them protection from predation and eventually allow for the specialization of cells. And this is going to first happen in something like, like a seaweed, where we have a special, specialized cells that allow the roots or root-like structures to bury into the sand. And then the cells that are going to go up and have photosynthetic capabilities to be able to stay by the surface. And then eventually we end up with animals. So animals don't arise until 630 million years ago. That's our very first um, trace of animal fossils. That's found in the Precambrian era. And we do have older fossils that could have ex animal existence, but they're not exactly what we would consider to be animals just yet. So again, they're kind of like an intermediary molecule. But in the Precambrian era, we have a ton of animals coming to life. So the earliest fossils, again, they're 600 million to 550 million years old. And that's going to include sponges and jellyfish. Again, we're in the waters. And these are going to eventually lead to worms, mollusks, and arthropods. However, we're not going to end up with modern invertebrates until much, much later, um, until the Paleozoic era. Then we end up with, again, this Cambrian period. So previously we were in the Precambrian period. Now we're in a Cambri Cambrian period. And in this era, we have a ton of what we call adaptive radiation or an explosion of diversity of animal species. In fact, almost every single one of the major groups of animals that are still alive on Earth today were already present by the early Cambrian era. So almost everything can track its lineage back to development in the Cambrian era. Why were there so many of these animals arising? Um, and it, the... The idea is perhaps these had arose many, many years prior, but we didn't have the ability to preserve it in our fossil record until this particular time frame. So this was maybe the best time frame for us to be able to preserve the fossils, and therefore we know of them. So it might be that they all appeared all at once because they actually had appeared way, way, way prior, but we weren't able to see a snapshot of them until the conditions were right for us to have a fossil record. However, we do know that predation is going to allow kind of a Wild West free-for-all for the evolution of motility and senses. So the early diversification of animals was probably the emergence of pre predator-prey relationships. And we know we have a ton of examples of co-evolution of predator and prey that are going to favor the faster animals and the animals with better vision. And so the evolution of efficient motion is often associated with the evolution of better sensory perception, things like vision and hearing and complex nervous systems. And all of this is driving forward in an evolutionary scale, right? The faster rabbit escapes predation, whereas the fastest wolf gets the food, right? And the fastest fox gets the food. And so over time, both the predator and the prey end up becoming faster, smarter, with better vision. Eventually, by the Silurian period, Silurian period, Silurian period, apologize, um, life in the seas included an array of complex animals, anatomically complex animals, and we had a ton of things, included trilobites, ammonites, and the nautilus. Um, all of these ex still exist today, almost nearly unchanged, well, not the trilobites, but the nautilus, almost entirely unchanged from its original form. So here's what a trilobite looked like. We know this from our fossil record. Here's what an ammonite looked like, and here's what a nautilus looks like, very similar to those early ammonite precursors. 
Eventually, we end up with animal diversity leading to the creation of a skeleton. Skeletons are going to improve your mobility and your protection. So they structurally allow you to be protected from predators. And the original sets of skeletons were known as exoskeletons or external body coverings. We as humans have endoskeletons or skeletons that are on the inside of our body. Exoskeletons are very important in the evolutionary history, though, because they are going to allow areas or hard surfaces where muscles can attach. All of a sudden, we can allow locomotion. They also are going to support the body and provide protection. Approximately 530 million years ago, we end up with the development of the first vertebrates. Vertebrates being animals with backbones, and that's actually going to be the fish. The fish develop a new form of body support that was entirely novel, um, an internal skeleton with muscles attached from the outside inward. And they took off. By 400 million years ago, fishes were a very diverse and prominent group and eventually become the most dominant predators in the ocean. They're faster than most invertebrates. They've got really acute senses, much larger brains, and eventually become the dominant predators of the seas. Now, eventually, life is going to end up in a, going from its watery existence onto land. And it takes over 3 billion years of life in the water in those shallow seas to be able to have life to come into land. And we had several major obstacles that land invading organisms had to face. One, the ability to support their own weight. Previously, they relied on the buoyancy of water. Secondarily, instead of just siphoning water from their surroundings, they had to find sources of water in their environment. And last but not least, but kind of tied to that water issue, they had to protect their gametes or their eggs from desiccation or drying out, right? Previously, picture frog eggs, they're laid in water, they're soft, right? They had to end up with external structures that were hard to be able to allow their eggs to stay um, alive and keep the water inside, even in a warmer environment or in a, um, in a dry environment. So... What happened was that we have large empty spaces of the landmass with nothing alive on it. And photosynthetic organisms had a great advantage because they could take harness of all of the sunshine that was provided on the land and there was no predators because nothing is going to try to eat you since nothing can crawl out of their water for very long. So the land was free of predators for plants and plants basically had untapped uh, soil. So soil had so many nutrients available to them that they had untapped potential. So they were able to grow very efficiently and very effectively in the moist soils of the water's edge to begin with and then eventually ended up with multicellular land plants about 475 million years ago. The first simple things that had to change for the plants to be able to survive on land was that they had to obtain and conserve their water and maintain the ability to stand upright. Now, previously, we did have root-like structures and things like seaweed, but that was just to protect them from the waves n knocking you back and forth. Now we have to actually fight gravity constantly and winds as well. Previously, land plants... Um, needed swimming sperm and they needed water to reproduce, right? So in order to become fully acclimated to the land, they had to be able to change that. Uh, if you could picture something like today's mosses and ferns, where they have to maintain moist areas or areas of abundant rainfall in order for their swimming sperm to be able to reach eggs and reproduce. Eventually, primitive land plants developed the waterproof coatings on the parts that were above ground, meaning that they had a reduction in the evaporative water loss capacity. They also had something called vascular tissues. Now they're able to bring water from the roots to the leaves. So the roots are no longer just providing support, but now they're actually harnessing water and pulling the water up from the roots into the leaves, which no longer have to get water on their own. So now we have the ability of the parts of the plant to have different specialized functions so we have parts that are photosynthetic and providing glucose to the parts that are underneath the ground, picking up the water and sending water up to the top leaves. All right, so during the Carboniferous period, it's warm and it's moist, and it's approximately 300 million years ago, well, 360 to 300 million years ago, we have a ton of giant tree ferns, club mosses, and horsetails. There's no predators available to them, and they basically have free reign of whatever landmass they're able to take over. And eventually we end up with seed plants. Now seed plants have a specialty um, advantage over plants that have swimming sperm because seed plants have their sperm encased in pollen, which is the, now what we know today, how most of our plants are going to um, reproduce. So seed plants inhabit drier regions 
and they no longer need water for reproduction because they have eggs retained in the parent plant, and the sperm are going to be um, pollen grains that are going to be dispersed by wind from one plant to another to be able to fertilize an egg on a plant that is a female plant, right, um, or the female portion of the plant. So when the pollen grains land near the egg, they can release the sperm directly into living tissue, so there's no need for a film of water on the surface. Eventually, the fertilized eggs develop inside the seeds, and the seeds provide the developing embryo with protection and nutrients. So it's kind of a win-win situation, and this allowed plants to go further and further inward on land as long as they had some sort of force um, for rainfall. Um, the very first seed-bearing plants, again, that's going to occur the, the 375 million years ago um, in what's called the Devonian period, and they made seeds along their branches and didn't have any specialized structures to hold them in. But over time, we end up with specialty structures that hold them in called um, cones, right? So conifers are a specialty type of plant that have seeds that develop inside cones. And conifers are going to be the main um, plants that flourish during the Permian period when it gets a lot drier than we had previously seen. And at this point, tree ferns and giant club mosses, again, they had swimming sperms. So they need moist conditions. And they went mainly extinct during this time frame because, again, the environment changed to become much drier. We don't end up with flowering plants until 140 million years ago. Now, what's interesting about flowering plants is that flowering plants are meant to interact with animals. The idea between the, behind the flower is that they entice an animal to come to get the nectar or whatnot. And at that time, they pick up pollen and carry it over to the next flower so they can then take the, the seed from one plant to another. This happened approximately 140 million years ago in a time frame called the Cretaceous period. And flower pollination is much more efficient than wind pollination. This is more of a direct delivery surface than opposed to like throwing something in the air and hoping that it makes it. So now we don't have to make as much pollen because we don't have to rely on wind dispersal. Wind, is plant, wind pollinated plants have to produce an enormous amount of pollen in order to reach their intended part, target, whereas flower pollinated plants um, that are going to be pollinated by animals can be much more efficient than the wind pollinated plants. Now, as the land plants evolved, and they have a draw now, right, they've got nectar, so it becomes a food source for animals, providing a potential food source for other organisms, animals are starting to emerge from the sea. So land animals emerged approximately 430 million years ago, and the very first ones to emerge were the arthropods. Arthropods are a type of animal or a series of types of animals. They're invertebrates with jointed appendages and an external skeleton, and you recognize them in, you know, today as insects, spiders, scorpions, centipedes, crabs, etc. So arthropods were the very first animals to inhabit land. And um, in a scary science fiction sort of way, arthropods dominated the earth for tens of millions of years. So for tens of millions of years, centipedes were the, one of the dominant land um, animals because they had such a fantastic exoskeleton. Exoskeleton gives the arthropods an advantage because it's waterproof for one. It provides support against the force of gravity and nothing can get through it in terms of predation. So it allows um, these animals to have their free roam of the earth. Now eventually, at, this, at a very similar time frame, we end up with amphibians. So amphibians are evolving from fish, especially a type of fish that are called lobe fin fish. Now lobe fins are special because they have fleshy fins that allow them to crawl about on the bottoms of the shallow waters. And they also have a specialty digestive tract that has an outpouch. And that outpouch can be filled up like a balloon, like a primitive lung basically, that can be filled up with air. And that allowed them to travel outside of the water for short periods of time because they were able to bring their source of, um, their source of, of air with them. Now, the lobe fin fish eventually turn into the amphibians, um, but the lobe fin appear approximately 400 million years ago, and this is what they look like. So they've got these little fins that allow them to walk about in the shallow waters, and again, that outpouching that allows them to pull in air. And eventually, that early lung is going to end up having a, quite a bit of improvement, and those lobe fins are going to turn into legs. So that's going to give rise to amphibians, and this occurs approximately 370 million years ago. Now, the primitive lungs were very, very simple. They had very small sacs, very limited surface area. So they still had to ex obtain oxygen through their skin, which meant that they had to live in, a, and they also had to deposit their sperm and eggs in a watery environment. So both of these meant that they had to stay close to um, a water source. So they were able to move about on land, but they were limited on how far they could travel away from their water source. And they also suffered the same decline as the tree ferns and the club mosses when the climate changed in the Permian period about 300 million years ago and became much, much drier. 
Amphibians at this point would evolve into reptiles. Um, reptiles are a specialty type of amphibians that adapted to that drier climate and had specialty adaptations to life on land. First and foremost, their eggs became shelled and waterproof. And this is what I was mentioning. Now we have a supply of water for the developing embryo in a dry environment. They also went from skin that had to have absorption of oxygen and was always had to be wet to scales that were waterproof that helped prevent the loss of body water to the dry air. This had to be accompanied at the same time by improved lung capacity because they were losing a source of oxygen which was previously coming through their skin. So the climate's getting drier and reptiles are now becoming the dominant land vertebrates during the Permian period where at this point amphibians were relegated to the swampy backwaters, same with mosses and ferns, etc., where most currently are still remain. So most types of amphibians on the planet today still survive in backwaters and swampy, marshy regions. Eventually, reptiles evolved to be much, much larger, and this allowed for the evolution of dinosaurs specifically. So the climate became much wetter again, and dinosaurs evolved into a great variety. We had a ponderous variety of dinosaur forms, from fleet-footed to predators um, to plant eaters, so multiple different types of um, dinosaurs available, and they flourished for over 100 million years. They were the dominant life form for quite a while until approximately 65 million years ago when dinosaurs became extinct. And while the def definite reason for extinction remains unknown, there's um, quite a lot of speculation and lots of lines of evidence that demonstrate that they were um, killed off when a meteor hit the Yucatan Peninsula. All right, moving on. So these reptiles eventually gave rise to mammals. So what's the difference between reptiles and mammals? Both have eggs, but reptiles lay eggs, whereas mammals have internal fertilization and live birth. So they, they breed live young. They also produce milk. So producing secretions from the mammary gland and having live birth and developing hair, which provides insulation for these individuals, are the characteristic or hallmarks of mammals. Mammals um, arrive in the fossil record approximately 200 million years ago, and early mammals coexisted alongside the dinosaurs for quite a while with, uh, with distinctive skeletal features. Now, most of these early mammals were very, very small, mostly small creatures the size of rodents. In fact, at that time, the largest known mammal from the dinosaur era is about the size of a raccoon today, um, but most were far, far smaller than that. And why? Because dinosaurs would have looked at them as a food source, right? Um, however, once the dinosaurs went extinct, mammals started to colonize the habitats that were left behind by the extinct um, reptiles, and then mam mammals prospered. And that diversified into all the various forms of mammals that are seen on Earth today. And eventually, we can see that we have dynasties, right? So first we have amphibians, then we have... Well, um, then we have, of course, we have lobe fishes, then we have amphibians, then we have um, reptiles, then we have dinosaurs, right? Every single set of animals have their own dynasty, and with the rise of each new dominant group comes the decline or extinction of the previous one. In fact, the most, pre most famous ones are, of course, the dinosaurs, but we are seeing mass extinctive events on our planet today at a pretty alarming scale as well. Um, Despite multiple extinctive events, overall trend has been that species arise at a faster rate than they disappear over, um, over the planetary lifespan. The number of species on Earth has tended to increase over time. However, um, we do have multiple eras where we have mass extinction events. A mass extinction occurs when a large amount of species disappear in a relatively small time frame. And the um, most catastrophic mass extinction was approximately 250 million years ago at the Permian extinction where over 90% of the world's species were wiped out all in one go, destroying entire ecosystems. And life became very, very close to disappearing altogether. However, um, they were able to survive and move on and lead to the life that we now know on the planet today. Um, and we do know that most of our mass extinctive events are caused by climate change. And once the climate changes, the organisms that live within that climate are either able to survive or they are not. And the organisms that have the adaptations that allow them to survive um, in one climate, right, the previous climate, might not be able to survive in a drastically different climate, meaning that we might see drastic um, mass extinctive events, especially when we have change in the temperature of the climate or the, the humidity of the climate. So warmer climates give rise to colder climates. And that's going to cause more variable temperature fluctuations, etc., which can cause species to become extinct. Um, another cause of um, species extinction or climate change that causes species extinction is 
continental drift. Now, continental drift is the result of something called plate tectonics. You may know that all of the continents on the planet lay on certain plates on the Earth, and the Earth's crust is divided into these irregular plates. They rest on top of a fluid layer of magma, and they're constantly crushing into another, or diverging away from another, and slipping past one another. And as they wander about the planet, the positions change. Um, in fact, North America is located in a totally different location now than it was 340 million years ago. It was located um, much closer to the equator, approximately 30, 340 million years ago, and eventually plate tectonics shifted it up into the regions that were more temperate and some Arctic. So here's North America 340 million years ago, um, in what we call um, the early stages of uh, Guandana and East Guandana land. We ended up with North America shifting much more further upward. Um, eventually at the 135 million years ago mark. So we go from this pre-Pangaea to the Pangaea where North America is shifting upward and eventually shifts all the way up to where we now see it today. Um, and so these are major changes in the continents from plate tectonics. And just as a side note, there's a lot of evidence that these regions were actually um, touching at one point. For example, these land masses have a high similarity of organisms that live here and also live for example, here in South America today, where Africa today was separated by a very large ocean, but the fossil record indicates that organisms that lived in those areas were actually very, very similar. Um, all right, so let's, but I, I digress. So let's get back to mass extinction events. Mass extinction events generally happen by huge catastrophic events. Um, something like a massive volcanic eruption, etc. However, even if a gigantic volcanic eruption occurred, it would probably only affect a very small portion of the Earth's surface. Um, however, the extinct event that wiped out the dinosaurs, which we believe to be caused by the impact of a huge meteorite, would have then sent a dust plume up into the air, and that dust plume, remember the impact was approximately 100 miles wide, and the meteorite was approximately six miles in diameter. So that would have sent a huge plume of dust up into the air, which then would have blocked out the sunlight, which would have blocked the ability of photosynthetic organisms to photosynthesize, leading to the death of the plants, leading to the death of the animals. So let's talk about the origin and evolution of humans. We're going to shift gears a little bit. Um, so there's a huge fossil record of human evolution. Um, however, it is not very complete. So although we have a lot of fossils from more modern times, the fossil evidence from early humans is incomplete, so comparatively scarce to some of the other fossil records, and it's open to a variety of interpretations, so there's been a lot of back and forth in the scientific community. However, what we do know is that humans, being a member of uh, primates, which is a specific type of mammals, that includes lemurs, monkeys, and apes, and we have a very oldest primate fossils are only 550 million years old, and we have very few of them in the fossil record, although we think that possibly, probably, far older primates existed, no fossil record has been found. Earliest primates would have fed on fruits and leaves, and have adaptations that allowed for life in the trees. And most of these adaptations are shared by primates across geological time. Here's a lot of different types of representative primates. Here's a tarsier, a lemur, and a macaque. And as a whole, we sure are a really adorable um, subset of organisms, right? And the interesting thing about primates is that they developed binocular vision. And binocular vision allows depth perception, which is a huge advantage in evolutionary time frame. So you'd have two eyes that face forward, it would have overlapping fields of view, and that allows them to be able to gauge distances when you're moving through the trees. This would allow you to swing from one tree to another, for example. Additionally, they had color vision, which is a huge advantage as well, because it allowed you to distinguish the ripe fruit from the green leaves, so you could actually know where you were headed to get your food source. So that allowed you to have an advantage over someone who was just randomly bumbling about, hoping to run into fruit. They also had opposable thumbs and a precision grip. Um, so they were, had grasping fingers that could wrap around and hold on to tree limbs, and then the opposable thumb would allow them to um, reach around from the opposite side. They have two sets of grips, which we as humans also have today, a precision grip that allows us to do small things. Consider ladies putting in your earrings, or something like brushing your teeth or opening a Ziploc bag, right? And a power grip, think picking up a, a hammer or thrusting with a spear. So they have two different sets of types of grip because the primate hands have a very specialty um, ability to use tools and also to have power. Additionally, humans have evolved a large brain that allowed the coordination of hand-eye coordination and allowed for complex social interactions, things like language and culture. This would allow um, an adapted advantage, things like locomotion through the trees, etc., which would allow for, uh, which would 
require hand-eye coordination and also binocular vision. So eventually we lead to hominids, and hominid fossils are originally found in Africa. And if you do a comparison of the human DNA with that of apes from this time frame, it suggests that the divergence occurred um, approximately 5.8, 5 to 8 million years ago, I apologize. And we have another intermediary, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce, that lived approximately 6 million years ago that exhibits human-like and ape-like characteristics. And this is skull um, put together from fragments of a skull of the earliest hominin. Now, knowledge of the early hominid species is very limited because we have very few specimens, and those specimens are generally only partial skeletons. But the very first well-known hominid line arise approximately 4 million years ago. Again, on an evolutionary time frame, we're coming in at the 11th hour. Early hominids were special from other organisms because they were able to stand and walk upright. And the bipedal locomotion would allow you to carry things around, which would be very important. These we know that we have um, the ability to walk upright at approximately 4 million years ago because we have fossilized footprints from the early Australopithecines demonstrated that they sometimes walked upright. So they would go back and forth between knuckle walking and upright walking. Now an upright stance, again, it's very important in evolution because it allows you to have your hands free. This allows you to carry food, for example, or weapons. It allows you to manipulate tools and do any other types of cultural revolutions like painting or early making a flute and playing music, etc would have been um, hallmarks of the modern Homo sapiens. Again, they believe that the hominin fossils arose in Africa. The earliest would be the Australopithecines, and that's unearthed in an area of Kenya from a lake that was dated between 3.9 and 4.1 million years old. It was named Australopithecines um, anaminus because Anam means lake in the Ethiopian language, and they were found in the lake. Now, they found another species of Australopithecus, that arose again in Africa, in the Afar region of Ethiopia, and that was called Afarinius, um, Australopithecus Afarinius, and fossil remains of that species are approximately the same age, 3.9 million years old. That means that they were they arose at the same time. Um, additionally, Australopithecine um, Afarensi gave rise to two distinct forms, Africanus and Robustus. Um, Africanus was small, um, about the same size as Afarinus and an omnivore, whereas robusti and boisei were much larger than their forebearers, and they actually, instead of being omnivores, were herbivores. And we know that they all lived on the planet at the same time, and that we don't know exactly what happened, but we do know by the 1.2 million year mark, all Australopithecines were extinct, and one species gave rise to the genus Homo. That gave rise to Homo habilis, which arised 2.5 million years ago, and then Homo habilis, um, which was larger than Australopithecines, retained its ape-like arms and had shorter legs, and eventually gave rise to Homo erogaster, which appeared 2 million years ago, and had limb proportions much more recognizable of that of modern humans. Erogaster is the common ancestor of two major distinct branches of hominids, Erectus, pro approximately 1.8 million years ago, and um, Homo heidelbergenus, which then split into two branches as well, one that migrated into Europe and another migrated into Africa, giving rise to Homo sapiens, which are known as modern humans. So this is a depiction of the possible evolutionary tree for humans um, over time, starting with six million years ago and giving rise to um, what we would recognize as modern humans today. Major marks in the evolution of, home, of the Homo line was accompanied by advances in technology, including tools. Homo habilis produced crude tools, like chopping tools that were unchipped on one end and chipped on the other. They were able to hold it in the hand and chop things like wood or perhaps food. Um, Homo erogaster produced stone tools, sharp all the way around that had been tied sometimes to spears. And Neanderthalus produced fine tools with extremely sharp edges that were made by flipping off different edges of tiny bits of stone like obsidian. Here's an example of hominin tools from Homo habilis, Homo erogaster, and Homo neanderthalus. You can see the evolution of the types of tools um, and their specialty is going to increase as we end up going down the evolutionary pathways of the um, Homo line. By the time we reach Neanderthalus, we have very large brains and an excellent tool um, record. Neanderthalus appeared approximately 150,000 years ago in the European fossil record. And by 70,000 years ago, they had spread through Europe and Western Asia. However, by the 30,000 year mark, the species had become extinct. 
Now we know that Neanderthals were very similar to modern humans. They walked erect, they had large brains, they uh, were dexterous, they had finely crafted stone tools, and yet at some point they ended up becoming extinct. Now they have high similarities between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, but however, the major difference is that Neanderthals never developed any sort of culture, no art, language, music, rituals, etc. Whereas Homo sapiens, we now know, spend energy on things like funeral rites. Um, they express their love in things like music and paintings and art and crafts. We also know that um, Homo sapiens and Neanderthalus were entirely different species, and we know that from this DNA, from their records, they were able to extract DNA and create an entire Neanderthal genome from bones found in a cave in Croatia, and comparison of that back to the Homo sapien lines demonstrated that they are entirely different species. Um, but the sequence comparison demonstrated that 4% of non-African non humans' DNA is similar to distinctly Neanderthal sequences, suggesting that there was interbreeding of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens as recently as approximately 60,000 years ago. Um, which, as you may recall, is approximately when they went extinct, right? So Neanderthals are going to have disappeared from the fossil record, yeah, approximately 60,000 years. Yeah, by 30,000 years. So there were approximately 30,000 years of overlap. Um, I apologize. So, modern Africans don't carry the Neanderthal sequences, and yet other people do. So people that are non-African humans, therefore interbreeding must have occurred after the Homo sapiens left Africa, but before modern humans spread around the planet. And fossil record demonstrates that modern humans, that we would consider humans today, appeared in Africa approximately 160,000 years ago, and possibly as long as 195,000 years ago. And European and um, Homo sapien from Middle Eastern regions appeared approximately 90,000 years ago. They were known as Cro-Magnon now. So Cro-Magnons are a little bit more sophisticated than Neanderthals. And we have artifacts from 30,000 years ago, approximately the time that Neanderthals went extinct, um, from the Cro-Magnum archaeological sites, including things like bone flutes and ivory sculptures, ivory sculptures, sorry, and evidence of burial ceremonies. So art, crafts, culture, um, and things that are more above and beyond just the need to feed and clothe and shelter yourself. In fact, the most remarkable accomplishments of Cro-Magnons are the cave art left in Spain and France. Here's evidence of a Paleolithic burial. So this individual is, is ornamentally laid out, and you can see they have seeds, etc., that have been set about their head and around them. So they have not just died and been left in place, but they have been put together with prized possessions, right? Tools, etc. And here's art. So some paintings from the Cro Magdan people, actually very complex paintings, better than perhaps I could do, um, that have been that demonstrate hunting in this era of this of man. So we do know that Cro-Magnons and Neanderthals lived side by side. They coexisted for as many as 50,000 years ago before the extinction of, Cro of Neanderthals. And we know that Cro-Magnons interbred with Neanderthals. But we don't really have a good hypothesis um, on why these or how these two kinds of hominids managed to coexist for all that time. Again, we know the human family tree is rooted in Africa and that hominids found their way out of Africa multiple different times, including when Homo erectus left and reached Asia two million years ago and when Heidel Virginis uh, Burgenesis uh, made it to Europe approximately uh, 780,000 years ago. We also know that Homo made multiple trips, distance migrations out of Africa. So we have something called the African Replacement Hypothesis, which states that Homo sapiens emerged out of Africa approximately 150,000 years ago and spread to multiple regions, including the Near East, Europe, and Asia, and then replaced all other hominids. So the African Replacement Hypothesis is that we did originally have the Homo erectus exiting from Africa, and then later on when Homo sapiens developed, they also exited and eventually displaced all other Homo erectus or hominids um, on the planet. Um, we also have a multi-regional hypothesis, uh, which states that migrations and interbreeding among Homo erectus populations in different regions of the world maintain them as a single species and eventually evolved into Homo sapiens. So we do have two separate ideas of how it could have happened. So that looks more like this, right? So we have um, the exit to multiple different locations, and then eventually interbreeding means that we were going to force them down the lineage to become Homo sapiens. Um, we also know that the evolution has pressured Homo sapiens into larger brains. We believe that's related to meat diets and also cooking. So highly developed, brains, uh, highly developed brains lead to complex social interactions 
including cooperative hunting, which means that you can take down much larger game than you could take down by yourself, when you can disperse a large um, animal amongst the entire village without letting the meat go to waste. And so if we had distribution of group hunted meat, um, and that's best accomplished by smarter individuals, then over time natural selection would have favored such individuals, right? If you weren't smart enough to hunt the mammoth, or if you let yourself get killed by the mammoth, then you and your lineage would perish because you, you died off and your offspring would have no food. Um, this larger brain led to the sophistication of culture. It allowed for things like language, abstract thought, and advanced culture. Symbolic thought would not have been able to arise without these larger brains, and if early humans were capable of things like language and symbolic thought, um, that would not necessarily have created artifacts that indicated these capabilities, but the presence of artifacts that indicate these capabilities demonstrate absolutely that humans did have these ability to have this complex culture. We also know that biological evolution is still continuing in humans today. Natural selective pressure is still influencing human bodies. Um, we thought that it was slowed or halted after we began to live our advanced societies where we no longer had selective pressure. However, now that we're looking at DNA and DNA sequencing and we're able to look at the sequence of multiple different sets of humans across the planet, we're able to analyze sequences of a growing number of he human genomes, and we do have evidence that we are still undergoing the process of natural selection and evolution. People have rapidly evolved over time since the advent of music, art, language, and other hallmarks of what we consider to be advanced culture today. Um, and many of our genes, again, are still showing the telltale signs of evolution, even in recent millennia, um, including the ability to digest milk, so lactose tolerance, an allele that has developed within the past 7,000 years. And since it gave such a great advantage over individuals that had the lack of, inability, lack of ability to digest milk, uh, it became very prevalent in the population in a very short period of time. Um, we also know that culture evolves and that information in the culture evolves, behavior evolves, and that's generated from one generation to the next to the next. And we know that the evolutionary success of humans as the result of evolutionary, um, of culture evolution, and also technological revolutions. So we had a major revolution, the agricultural revolution, about 10,000 years ago when people were able to domesticate crops and domesticate animals. And that drastically increased the amount of food that was available to the human population, leading to an increase in the the level of the human population as well from about 5 million to about 750 million at the end of, or the mid of the 1750s. Then we had the Industrial Revolution, which gave rise to what we know today as the modern economy and drastic improvements in public health, which increased the lifespan and decreased infant mortality, and that led to a drastically explosive population boom as well. Uh, we know that culture evolves as well, um, and that we as a whole have become by evolutionary accident, very intelligent, and the stewards of life continuity on Earth. We did not ask for the role, but we cannot renounce it. We may not be suited for it, but yet here we are. So we have a responsibility as an advanced culture, in fact, one of the most advanced cultures on Earth, to take biological stewardship of our planet and savor it for, uh, save it for our future generations. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much for listening. Um, this is going to conclude our lecture series, so it has been an absolute pleasure having you in class. Aloha and happy studying. Take care and goodbye.